Thank you, Dr. Chu. Our last speaker in this uh, first session will be Dr. Robert Schriefer. Dr. Schriefer is director of the Institute for Theoretical Physics at the University of California in Santa Barbara. He's a distinguished scientist with an outstanding record in condensed matter physics. Bob is, in fact, the S in the BCS theory, which, and he shared the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1972. The BCS theory, or the barton cooper schriever theory, is the foundation of our current understanding of superconductivity. Perhaps the most important scientific issue relating to the new superconductivity is whether it can be understood in the context of the BCS theory. If not, the Nobel Prize might have to be returned. <laughs> Dr. Schrieber will speak on the current state of theory in superconductivity. Bob. You'll have to contact my wife for the money. <laughs> I would like to express my sincerest thanks to Dr. Block and the organizers of this uh, conference, Dr. Graham and others. Uh, I have for some time been concerned about the apparent lack of, um, I wouldn't say motivation, but some sort of capability for basic science and applied science and finally technology in this country to move forward. I think we have a unique opportunity here, and I'm very delighted to be part of it. <clears throat> Superconductivity, as John Bardeen told me as a beginning graduate student, is a unique example of quantum mechanics, that arcane subject that uh, you learn about in uh, graduate school. It's an example of superconductivity ap operating on a truly macroscopic scale. We all understand that in atoms and small molecules, electrons occupy definite quantum states or quantum energy levels. However, when one thinks of a large system, one thinks of it in a rather classical way. This uh, dias, the people here, are all in a superposition of many, many different quantum states. A superconductor is unique in the sense that all the electrons are condensed into a single condensate state, and that state flows as a totally frictionless fluid, and this fluid has truly remarkable properties. What we understood uh, early on uh, from the beautiful early work of Carmelionis and scientists for 50 years is that science does not depend totally on theory to make steps forward. What has happened since 1957 when we developed the theory of superconductivity, in essence, the field had become mature uh, most experiments, or if not all, could be understood in terms of the theory. This is fine for a mature subject, but it is the sure death of a subject. What uh, happened when uh, uh, Miller and Bednors, and uh, particularly Paul Chu and his co-workers, made an, an, not an Edisonian, but a PhD-level Edisonian discovery, uh, they shook the foundations of the theorists, they all scurried back to their tables, and dusted off their old theories, and we now see them being polished and shined up, and no one really knows what's going on, but one thing we know is that the phenomena are real and potentially will be of very great importance. If I have the first slide, please. The uh, theory of superconductivity, either for conventional superconductors or the new unconventional oxide superconductors must explain a number of facts. Of six of listed, I could list another 40 or 50 here. First of all is the original discovery of resistanceless flow. This is as close as probably man will or nature will ever get to perpetual motion. A current in a loop lasts essentially for the age of the universe for a thick wire. But more fundamentally is the so-called superdiamagnetism. Magnetic fields are expelled from the bulk of the specimen, only extending in perhaps a thousand atomic spacings or so. One of the most remarkable features of a superconductor is that, as I say, the electrons are condensed into some sort of a super macromolecule of electrons, 
in order to make an electron excited out of the molecule requires a finite energy in a superconductor, while there is no gap, uh, i.e., a uh, small energy can be given and excite electrons in the normal phase. Uh, the superconductor has remarkable conversion of DC voltage directly to AC current, the so-called Josephson effect, with a frequency proportional to the voltage, and you get about 500 megahertz per microvolt of applied uh, potential. We know that we must explain the critical uh, current densities that destroy superconductivity. We'd like to get these up to be a million or so uh, amps per square centimeter or more. Remarkable progress has been made in the uh, recent past on that high critical magnetic fields that Professor Chu just mentioned. And these have to do with pinning of these uh, flux tubes by defects, etc. Finally, the most dramatic effect, of course, is to uh, be able to account for the observed transition temperature in terms of the material properties. This is, in essence, the most difficult challenge for the theory of superconductivity because it depends not on the superconducting theory but on the normal state. Remarkably, we understand superconductors far, far better than we understand non-superconductors, and that's the problem. If we understood everything about the normal material, we believe we could be able to explain the superconductivity. At least it had been believed so. In the next slide, we'll talk what is the uh, superconductivity theory now in existence like. It's called the pairing or BCS theory. Uh, Basically, electrons in the normal state can be thought of as individual electrons moving without colliding with each other. We know this is not really true, but these are some effective so-called quasi-particles. They have no energy gap, but are scattered by defects or lattice vibrations. In the superconducting phase, a condensation takes place between these electrons in two steps. Conceptually, of course, it's just one actual step. Conceptually, the first step is two electrons are bound together by some so-called pairing attraction. We'll talk about that in just on the next slide. But there's some attraction which is strong enough to bind them together. And then these little diatomic or dielectron pairs condense into a superfluid, which is the object that carries the current without uh, resistance. A single pair would never uh, show superconductivity because it would be scattered but it's only the condensate which shows resistanceless flow. There is this energy gap, as I mentioned, and the gap varies as a function of temperature in a characteristic fashion, vanishing at the transition temperature. And up here, you have the normal metal. And here, with the gap, you have a superconductor. Actual superconductors have states within the gap as well, but these states are few in number and do not spoil the actual superconductivity. Well, with these very simple features, you can prove there is no electrical resistance and perfect diamagnetism, and the theory predicts most of the observed properties in a rather straightforward way. It's so simple, you don't hardly have to use computers to work out the theory, which is very nice. Next slide, please. Now, what causes the attraction? As I explained in my freshman physics class, what it causes the attraction can be understood by anyone who's gone to a cheap motel and slept on a mattress which has very bad springs. Uh, if you lie down on such a mattress, you can see the head of the individual is sinking down here, or this is like a ball on a rubber sheet. If there is another person in uh, the other side of the bed, you can see that that also, that person sinks. But then there's an inevitable attraction which leads to the two of them to sink in a common well. And this common well is called the mattress effect, and it is technically the word that is used. Uh, it's not my fault. <laughs> and, uh, and you'll notice one is with upspin, and the other is with downspin, and this is a pair. Now, there are also repulsions between electrons. This is the mattress or phonon attraction. The repulsion is the fact they have like charge, and this electric Coulomb repulsion pushes them apart. The question is whether the phonon attraction in a given material is stronger than the Coulomb repulsion. And if so, the phonon attraction causes superconductivity. Uh, the excess amount of attraction determines how high the transition temperature is. If this is a very strong attraction, then your principle could get a high TC. Unfortunately, uh, stability of the crystal tends to limit how strong this can get, and the system 
transforms to another phase if it gets very strong indeed. And what you find is that Tc as a function of strength goes up but then saturates and the system eventually becomes unstable. Calculations show that about 40 degrees is the maximum it seems that phonons can occur, but uh, we don't know everything, so uh, we'll see. Pairing theory, therefore, explains ordinary superconductivity in this phonon mechanism. Back in the uh, 60s, a number of other mechanisms were proposed which accounted for superconductivity, hopefully at higher temperature. Next slide, please. And I'll just list some of these. Uh, the first one is spin fluctuations. We'll also talk in the next slide about charge fluctuations uh, and other things. But uh, spin fluctuations are what make superfluid helium-3 a, a superfluid. That is, uh, these fluctuations cause pairing in this case. There are also similar effects occurring in the heavy fermion superconductors, uranium, uh, beryllium-13, et cetera, UPT-3. Uh, the first, there are three such effects, uh, two of which are well known. The first is the so-called paramagnon. An electron of spin up likes to have neighbors of spin up, and the second electron, too, likes also to have neighbors, so they share neighbors in common and are attracted by these so-called exchange interactions. Uh, the second is the so-called antiparamagnon. Instead of uh, spins liking nearest neighbors parallel, they like them antiparallel, and this antiparamagnon is what one might expect in these materials, the uh, high temperature materials, since they're known to be either antiferromagnetic or incipient antiferromagnets. It turns out that both of these mechanisms lead to orbital bound states of a pair which are not spherically symmetric or cylindrically symmetric, but rather have nodes. And these nodes tend to get destroyed by scattering off of impurities, uh, phonons, defects. And these tend to get suppressed by the defect nature of the system. I'd like today to propose a, a new scheme which hasn't, to my knowledge, been talked about. I'd like to call it the spin bag mechanism. You've got to have a catchy phrase to make a, a, a sale in this field. And uh, the idea is, in these two cases, the spin fluctuations are increased between the spins uh, being paired, that is, the increase is between one and two, while I would like to argue that it's really decreased. There's a natural level of fluctuations in the system before the two electrons come, but this level is suppressed by the presence of the two electrons. We know this very well in quantum chromodynamics, the things that hold the quarks together that make protons. There's a bag made out of fluctuations being suppressed, and you can consider it as oil on the water. The electron coming in quiets down the spin fluctuations, and the other electron will come in this quiet sea and share this uh, quiet area. So thanks very much. So that's a yet another idea that's thrown into the ring. Next, next slide, please. Uh, another area is so-called charge fluctuations rather than spin fluctuations. These have been around quite a long time, 25, 30 years. And uh, in this context, it could be the copper transferring an electron to the oxygen. This is perhaps a resonance called an exciton. There's nice evidence for this in the optical properties of these materials at about a half a volt, perhaps. Uh, if you transfer the electron all the way to the next copper, one usually calls that a plasmon or a demon, a demon being a D-band plasmon, etc. Another catchy phrase. Uh, and the idea is basically one electron will push an electron in the uh, system from copper to copper, leaving a positive ion behind that gets uh, an attractive effect. Next slide, please. And these are all pairing mechanisms. You pair electrons together to form bound states out of which the condensate forms. There's another scheme, however, so-called RVB, that depends on so-called bosons. And uh, these uh, are a very different type of theory. It will be quite interesting which of the two uh, survive. My own bet is this, but then I'm rather conservative since I don't want to return anything. Uh, Last slide, please. Conclusions. One, I believe that the phonon mechanism is unlikely to account for materials of superconduct, su superconducting above 90 degrees or of that order. Uh, there are many other mechanisms, as I mentioned, 
which depend upon large electronic energies rather than small phonon energies, and I think potentially can lead to quite high TC. Uh, we were never able to prove an upper limit for the phonons, and I think this is even more so now for the other electronic mechanisms. Antiferromagnetism or dielectric anomalies, these excitons, may either or both be related to the high TC materials, and I think they very likely are. Uh, I believe the pairing mechanism, uh, there's no reason to believe that that's not the correct one, but the Bose condensation remains, and high TC is, of course, an exciting area. I'd just like to make one or two closing remarks. Uh, I'd like to join in the previous speakers and encourage that a broad program be uh, followed, both by the federal government and by industry. Uh, I think this is very important. Uh, we don't know what's going to occur uh, if we don't have a rigid structure. If we have a rigid structure, it's hard to say anything really new will come. Fortunately, empirical science is back in a big way. I've always been very concerned that theorists dictate experiments to a certain extent. I, I don't think that's good science. Mother Nature has been indeed very, very kind to us. I think we ought to be very dedicated to her and very kind in pursuing these wonderful gems. Thank you. Can we have slides, please? Thank you, Bob, uh, for a very interesting talk. We have a few minutes, which I would like to use to, uh, to give uh, the other participants here some time, a uh, few seconds, to comment on, to comment on, on Bob's uh, um, outline of, of, a, of a theory. Paul Drew, would you want to comment on it? Can we turn that microphone on, please? Well, if not, on. come up here. Bob, as an experimentalist, even though you say you don't want the theorists to dictate experiments, and I would like to ask for guidance, what are the crucial experiments that you have in mind to test the theories, to tell unambiguously or even vaguely uh, one from the other? I believe, uh, for example, in the spin density approach, any of the three, uh, it's very important to do inelastic neutron scattering uh, at finite angles away from the Bragg peaks to look for these spin fluctuations, try to determine the rough uh, RMS amplitude of them and uh, see if they are there. Uh, one should be able to see in the normal state some effects associated with applied magnetic fields on these, although they're very weak effects, I believe they will be there. If one puts pressure on, I think you will change the exchange integrals and one can make some estimate as to how it goes up and down. Charge fluctuations, we know you can look at in uh, optical properties, infrared properties, and uh, I think one has to do broad science through a large number of experiments, as usual, uh, with a local experiment, it's hard to tell what an elephant looks like, but with 2,000 people measuring all over, you can put the roadmap together, and I think that's what's needed. Okay. Uh, Angelica, you want to comment on it? I think uh, the microphone hopefully will work. Go ahead. I guess I'd like to just reiterate what Professor Schrieffer said about looking for new materials with uh, new properties. We didn't predict these, that these materials, that these oxides would superconduct at, su at such high temperatures. We really need to continue making new materials, characterizing their properties, and hopefully we'll find many other things, in, including superconductivity, but other properties as well that will be quite useful to technology. OK, thank you, Angelica. Bob, uh, let me ask you and start with you on a, on a different kind of attack. This is an audience of industry, government, and, uh, and university uh, people. Uh, how do we work together? Well, I think there are clearly a number of uh, patterns which already are working one way or another. Um, my own view is that uh, if we could get government, industry, and university together in a number of smaller uh, programs on perhaps university campuses with small industries around them, that might be one way. I think it's important that people not only have monthly contact but daily contact in these fields. 
I think also too large a group can uh, wither away the intrinsic strengths. So small groups on a campus with perhaps some allied small companies nearby might be one format. Paul, do you want to comment on the same question? Uh, yes, I think. I think basically I, t I totally agree with uh, Bob's uh, comments. And I think the strength of this society is its diversity, especially in the research area. And I would like to see that the research area will, uh, including the funding agencies, should, have, uh, should be given maximum uh, flexibility as far as research is concerned. And of course, in the applied area, perhaps we need a little bit coordination, but the detail has to be worked out based on the backgrounds and the social uh, um, uh, characteristics of the society. Angelica, do you want to comment? Yeah, I think it's an exciting time because there's a certain openness that goes with a very fast-moving field. We don't have time for uh, proprietary uh, discoveries at this point. And so, so I think we're all enjoying good collaborations between universities and industries and national labs, and I hope that this will continue. Very good. Um, let me... Uh, ask a, a third uh, question which has to do with our educational process. Our educational process is always lagging behind, especially undergraduate education in, in both the sciences and in engineering. How do, how do we avoid this this time? Bob, you volunteered for an answer. <laughs> Uh, as I think all faculty members were always concerned not only about graduate education but undergraduate. I recall visiting China in 1975 with Ted Jabal, John Bardeen and others and we saw people being trained in superconductivity but they didn't know Newton's equations and they didn't know calculus. Uh, I think one of the most important things is to remember that education is a, an education about learning in the future. It has to teach us how to, to learn. Uh, we need a very broad one. Nevertheless, I think some excitement has to be passed along at a very early date, or else people run out of gas and move off to be doctors and lawyers and what have you. My son did that himself, and I don't say it's wrong, but I think we have an opportunity here to use this, do some PR, and it'll be a lot of fun for the student. Angelica, you want to come in? Yeah, the, um, I've been working with a group of high school uh, teachers who say that their students are very excited about these superconductors. I think one of the best things we can do is supply the teachers with the know-how and the materials to help their students make these superconductors and, and become excited about uh, the properties of these new materials. Paul, you have the last word on that question. I think. I think no matter what comes out from uh, this um, uh, interesting material, I think one thing for sure, uh, it has revived the public interest um, in science of this country, and uh, which will be very important for the future of this country. In fact, I was told in one court case, and uh, a mother who is, who is my friend took uh, her son to the court, and, uh, and they were waiting for some lecture uh, from the judge. Instead of giving a lecture, the judge was telling his uh, her son about superconductivity. And so uh, I think it will have some effect. And I personally, and I'm quite sure many people in this room do believe we're going to be benefited from this discovery. OK, thank you very much. This uh, really brings the session to an end. We have heard this morning of the very dramatic progress that has been made in superconductivity in a very few short months. It's an impressive story and does great credit to the individual involved, including our three speakers this morning. It is also a credit to our system of supporting and encouraging science and engineering research. Those are strongly positive points, but I will close with a word of warning. Turning basic research in superconductivity into practical technologies would be a long and a very difficult process. Solving the many problems along the way will take both commitment and time. Other countries, Japan in particular, have shown in other areas that such patience and commitments can produce spectacular results. Our economic and industrial culture finds it difficult to do the same many times. But if we do not sustain the effort for the time necessary, and that time, I believe, must be measured in years, not in months, then others will reap the benefits of the insights our laboratories have produced. This Council on Superconductivity under Jay Kiebers that was announced this morning, I think will help us 
to keep uh, our eyes on the ball. It will be up to all of us, however, to make sure that, that, is not, that, that we, we, we persist and that we are staying the course in this very important and vital area. Thank you very much. Our next panel will be the review of current commercial applications of superconductivity, and it is chaired by Dr. Mary Good, who has been president of the Engineered Materials Research Division of Allied Signal Corporation since 1985. Prior to that, Dr. Good was vice president and director of research at UOP Company, which was one of the firms under Signal Corporation before their merger with Allied. And there she was responsible for oil and gas technology development. Dr. Good currently serves as president of the American Chemical Society. Please welcome Dr. Good, who will introduce her panel members. Donna, thank you very much. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, and in way of introducing this particular program, if I may have my first slide. One of the uh, measures of success in the United States, which is quite different, I think, from other parts of the world, is that uh, superconduct, uh, particularly high temperature superconductivity, has had the pleasure of one full editorial in the Wall Street Journal, and it has made the comic strips. This means that we have arrived. So if there's any question about whether or not this is an appropriate topic, I think the Bloom County uh, uh, display that you see which says that at least physicists are as worthy as football quarterbacks. I think that we're just about there. Now, if I may have the next slide, please. Uh, the technologies that we're talking about today, uh, it turns out that, as Bill Graham indicated earlier, the, it is assumed that high temperature superconductivity will have the impact of many of the breakthroughs of the past. However, it is assumed that the innovations will come much more rapidly than in the past. Now, it took years for transistor technology to permeate high technology and consumer products. High temperature superconductivity will, I think, move much more rapidly, partially because superconductivity devices are already in the marketplace utilizing low temperature devices. If I may have the next slide, please. The current applications uh, are the subject, really, of this segment of the program. Those areas where superconducting devices are already in the, in the commercial field and what some of their uh, contributions and applications are. Now, the two major commercial applications of superconductors today are either in magnetic applications, uh, superconductors where the high current, strong magnetic fields are what is of importance. The second is in electronic applications, uh, particularly in Josephson junction technology, where we're measuring small changes in magnetic fields. And the two speakers on this segment of the program will speak at least one example of each of those. Now, if I might have the next slide, please, just to give you uh, an overview of some of the magnetic applications, which are already there and in place. These include nuclear magnetic resonance. It includes in that the medical resonance imaging technology, which we will have a speaker uh, visit a little bit later. It also includes scientific laboratory instruments. For example, superconducting magnets have made nuclear magnetic resonance a workhorse of the chemical and biological research community. These inst this instrumentation has really made it possible to study molecular motion in the liquid phase, which has been one of the goals of chemists and biologists for a long period of time. 
In addition to that, there are those uh, high energy particle accelerators which are the workhorse of many of the physics projects of today. The Fermilab Tevatron and the proposed super uh, colliding uh, uh, magnet which is proposed in the future. Now electric utility systems, there has been some work already in that area where we have superconducting magnetic energy storage. Uh, we have magnetometers which measure magnetic moment, particularly the vibrating sample magnetometers. And there has been some utility of superconducting magnets to separate magnetic impurities. If I may have the next slide, you can see at least an example. This is one of the new uh, imaging devices which has found such a home in the medical community and is providing such detailed information about human tissue. Uh, the next slide, I think, will show you the magnitude of the effort that goes into the things like the physics establishment on the Fermilab Tevatron, which is the first one. Uh, this is a, a, a magnet field which has a three mile uh, circumference, has a trillion electron volts, is based on the current niobium titanium alloy systems, has better than 900 magnets. Now the super collider which is proposed will up that to a 52 mile circumference, would have 20 uh, TEV and still use the same niobium uh, titanium alloy systems with better than 10,000 magnets. The magnitude of that is shown on the next slide which just indicates the uh, track of the current Fermilab system and the next slide will give you a picture of what the superconducting equipment looks like. Uh, if you look at the bottom, uh, the yellow piece, you can actually see the cryogenic system as well as the magnets, and it gives you some feeling for the, uh, the grandeur, if you will, of that particular system which is in that tunnel which runs around the Fermilab uh, application. Now the next slide uh, very briefly looks at electronic applications, uh, particularly the Josephson Junction ultra-high-speed switching devices, uh, which include the squid, which uh, uh, was discussed very briefly this morning, uh, the superconductivity quantum interference device, which is going to allow us to look at very small magnetic field changes uh, to study things like brain waves, uh, look for uh, very uh, look for oil deposits in various parts of the world, uh, defense applications in, in submarine location, and so on. And the last one is high-speed circuitry, which is going to be discussed in some detail this morning by our first speaker. Now, if I can have the next slide, I just want to make a couple of comments about the barriers that have been overcome by the current applications. The uh, barriers here are really very large. Uh, first is that the applications we'll be speaking to today have overcome the low operating temperatures, and most of them are operating below 10 degrees, many of them at liquid helium temperatures. They've also overcome the complexity of the uh, Josephson Junction circuitry, which is not trivial. And the third one is the fabrication of materials, both in wires and thin films, which was briefly discussed earlier in the research-based uh, issues of, in the last panel. And the last, of course, is the communication difficulty, which has had to be overcome between the supercooled and the room temperature components of the equipment that will be discussed. Now the next slide will show you actually the fact that there is really a very large current effort in superconducting technology and commercial niobium based Josephson devices uh, commercialized by Hypris in 1987 with lots of other participants including uh, big electronic houses in the United States and their counterparts particularly in Japan. In addition to that, there's a fair amount of United States government sponsored work, particularly some uh, dedicated to the SDI program, and then of course in the uh, DOE programs in both fission, fusion and energy conservation. And last but not least, the major effort in Japan with respect to the supercomputer utilizing these kinds of new types of devices. Now at this point, I'd like to introduce, and if I may have the next slide, I'd like to introduce the two speakers today who are going to speak to you about real commercial applications that are presently in place. These are uh, companies which are actually selling product uh, and have indeed overcome the kinds of difficulties that I showed you in that earlier slide. 
Now, the first of these is uh, Dr. Sadig Ferris, who is president and CEO of the Hypris uh, Incorporated. He's going to speak to you today on the impact of the superconducting electronics revolution on commercial and DOD type applications. Now, before Dr. Ferris formed Hypris in 1983, he spent eight years at IBM in the Yorktown Heights, New York research facility working on the development of high-speed superconducting computers utilizing Josephson Junction technology. Dr. Ferris has invented memory cells, laser programmable lo logic arrays, a sampling system that measures electrical and optical picosecond signals, and a large variety of other superconducting uh, devices. Now, for these efforts, uh, IBM awarded Dr. Ferris seven Invention Achievement Awards. And in 1983, he received IBM's Outstanding Innovation Award for his invention and development of a superconducting oscilloscope. Now, his development of the Quiteron was chosen by IBM as the invention of the year in 1983. He holds 15 patents and is the author of over 40 publications in the science and technology of superconductivity and optics. Dr. Farish received all of his degrees, uh, his BS, MS, and PhD in electrical engineering and computer sciences from, Berk from California, University of California, Berkeley. However, just before I bring him on, this reading of his life and career his, his life, really, and his career are much more interesting and colorful than that particular technical biography. Uh, Dr. Ferris spent his childhood in Libya, finishing high school at an orphanage in school. His scholastic ability won him an Exxon Fellowship to study in the United States. After completing his degree in electrical engineering, he returned to the oil fields in his native country. Again on scholarship, he returned to Berkeley and got his graduate degrees. Now, after his eight years at IBM, he, funded, he founded Hypris with venture capital funding. His success has been based on perseverance and hard work coupled to new technology. It's an excellent example of the potential of new startup companies in this country. He has described himself as just an immigrant from the Sahara. Dr. Ferris has also claims to have introduced the third electronics revolution. Let's hear from him now and see if we believe that. Dr. Ferris? Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I'd like to tell you about my uh, first uh, and favorite uh, venture capitalist, uh, a very shrewd business lady uh, who financed Columbus to discover America. And if that didn't happen, I would still be confined in the Sahara. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to participate and be involved in this timely and significant conference. I would like to share with you my experiences related to the introduction of the third electronics revolution. And I hope to give you a perspective which may be applied to the exciting uh, high TC superconductivity which this conference is all about. I want to focus my attention on the commercialization of supercondu superconducting electronics today. Why do I call it the third age of electronics or the, thir the third electronics revolution? I will answer by giving you a little bit of history to remind you of what is required to transfer invention to commercial reality. The first slide, please. The first electronics revolution really started with the vacuum tube, which was invented in 1904. And by 1930, 13 million radio sets were in American homes. Most of you are too young to remember vacuum tubes. I made sure I bring some of these here. And they are real. Uh, I could smash one of them, but I would hurt myself. Recognizing the limitations of vacuum tubes, scientists at Bell Labs invented the 19, in 1947 the transistor, thus ushering in the, the second electronics revolution. In 1954, Texas Instruments uh, introduced the first pocket-sized uh, radio, 
And in the first year, 100,000 of these radios were sold. And in 1959, the integrated circuit was invented. And uh, you can see what it has done to our lives. For quite some time, the limitations of transistors uh, had been known. Uh, those visionary scientists like Paul Chu and others uh, have a quest for the next technology, for the future. And superconductivity has been uh, considered as one of those. Um, the, thus, the third electronics revolution uh, is introduced uh, to the market this year by Hypers Incorporated. The first superconducting integrated circuit chips which have uh, the complexity needed to make very sophisticated electronics products. Hypers really should not take the credit for this. Uh, Bell Labs, uh, John Rowell made the first Josephson Junction and had the first patent on the use of Josephson Junction uh, in logic and memory circuits. And I must not for forget or ignore IBM's pioneering contribution in the integrated circuit uh, technology uh, related to superconducting electronics. Uh, let me show you the first system uh, which really made superconducting electronics reality. I, I show you this system for many reasons. First of all, uh, this demonstrates that the United States is the first country to introduce sophisticated electronic system based on superconductivity, which has uh, utility. Secondly, uh, I want to uh, emphasize that there is a great deal of work that has to be done before you can take a technology to market. And I would like to uh, share with you uh, today what these uh, obstacles uh, that one has to overcome in order to achieve commercial reality. So the presentation is going to have this outline. I tell you about the unique properties of superconducting electronics and why we care about them. Uh, secondly, I will uh, mention uh, the relevance of these properties uh, to commercial and military applications that hopefully will not only give us the uh, supremacy in uh, technology, but also uh, ensures our national security. And I'm going to share with you the challenges uh, and the technologies that had to be developed uh, to commercialize the first picosecond signal processing system. Um, all of the issues mentioned here today uh, are based on niobium and niobium nitride uh, superconducting technology. But it is going, uh, these issues are going to be relevant to the exciting high uh, temperature superconductivity. Then I will show you what the system performance uh, is and uh, how we uh, could use it to advance uh, our technological leadership. And if I have a few moments, I'll tell you how, I could win, how we could win uh, the race in superconducting electronics. Next slide, please. The superconducting electronics have recognized for quite some time that they have these exciting properties. Switching speed in the picoseconds and can be extended to the sub-picosecond. For example, the advent of this high TC superconductivity gives us an additional factor of 10 uh, potential improvement in speed. The second property is the extremely low power dissipation. This is intrinsic to superconductivity. Uh, Superconducting devices dissipate 1,000 less power than uh, their semiconducting counterparts. Uh, the third property is the ability to transmit very high speed signal through uh, dispersionless transmission lines uh, without distortion. These transmission lines can be made extremely uh, high uh, density and uh, they are necessary for interconnecting very sophisticated uh, uh, chips into a very complicated system. The final capability, the final property is the ability to integrate uh, many functions on inexpensive substrates. For instance, 
uh, sensors, digital processing circuits, and analog circuits can be integrated on uh, glass substrates. That's a very important reason why we call this the third uh, revolution in electronics as opposed to the crystalline semiconductors that we have known in the past. Next slide, please. Uh, there are two figures of merit in comparing uh, devices or technologies. Uh, the vertical is the speed and the horizontal is the power dissipation. Note in the upper right hand side the conventional technologies uh, which have, uh, which dissipate about milliwatt and uh, in order to uh, reach the goal of five to 10 uh, picosecond, a picosecond is one trillionth of a second. Um, one has to resort to very expensive means to achieve those results. Uh, for instance, one, ha one still had to cool or one had to use very small geometries. On the other hand, if you look at what superconducting electronics could do, you could still use very large devices and uh, obtain one or two picosecond speeds. And uh, the power dissipation, as you can see here, is about a microwatt. Now, if we use similar expensive tools with superconducting electronics, for instance, uh, line widths of less than one micron, it is possible to achieve uh, what's called femtosecond. Uh, 10 femtosecond is, in, is achievable in the future with this uh, uh, high PC material. And this is the reason there are uh, extremely exciting applications that exploit this performance gap between this technology and this superconducting technology. Next slide. The, there are many, many applications that uh, are exciting from a commercial uh, and military point of view. Uh, at Hypris, we chose the test and measurement instrument uh, field because these are the uh, necessary tools which should enable us to advance uh, developments of computers, communication systems, uh, and other uh, systems. We chose the sampling oscilloscope, which is the ability to see extremely fast and extremely faint electronic signals. And uh, this is the system that I will be describing uh, in a little bit more detail today. There are other applications like network analyzers, transient recorders, uh, A to D converters, and voltage standards. All of these are necessary in order for us to advance uh, our science and technology. Next, uh, the superconductivity has extremely high sensitivity uh, to uh, a wide range of uh, fields from uh, very uh, low frequencies all the way to the uh, infrared, visible, or the uh, ultraviolet. And this extremely wide range uh, has the potential of giving us uh, very exciting applications in communications and imaging and uh, for uh, anti-submarine warfare, uh, the ability to detect uh, quiet submarines uh, and the ability to uh, measure extremely faint magnetic fields emanating from the brain uh, to be able to detect the functions uh, of the brain and detect uh, epileptic seizures which uh, up until now haven't been able to detect uh, uh, clearly and uh, geophysical exploration and uh, uh, advancing uh, the science, uh, astrophysics, etc. Next slide. Of course, uh, IBM made a great deal of uh, uh, innovations and uh, it is, we, we still believe it's possible uh, that uh, mainframes and supercomputers uh, will come from superconducting electronics in, uh, in the early uh, next century or even late this century. Uh, many necessary components have already been made. Uh, next slide, please. In uh, communications, uh, very high frequency in the millimeter uh, range and the submillimeter uh, range uh, will be possible with superconducting electronics. Many of these components have already been made with superconducting uh, devices and uh, uh, SDI and uh, Air Force and ONR have already uh, funded uh, work leading to making such components and uh, we're looking forward to integrating uh, these components to uh, sophisticated systems. Next. 
now uh, discovering uh, a new material and uh, making a thin film is really the tip of the iceberg. How do you go from here uh, to commercial uh, realization uh, of that uh, discovery? This is just to give you an example of what it takes to implement uh, a simple uh, Josephson Junction circuit. And here I show you different uh, metal layers, okay, coded, and uh, there is this vertical structure that one has to make uh, designed properly uh, for performance as well as uh, low cost. And uh, so I would like to uh, share with you the other hurdles that we must overcome in order to go from making good films, good circuits, and all the way to a commercial, uh, commercially available system that performs a useful function at the customer site. Next slide, please. Uh, here is an example of uh, complex uh, Josephson uh, junction uh, circuits uh, using inexpensive glass. Note that it is transparent. And if uh, one uh, magnifies the, where I'm pointing right now, uh, one sees a very complex circuit in the, in the next slide. Here is an example of a complex uh, electro superconducting electro electronic circuit that performs a useful function these rectangles are Josephson Junction, which have uh, extremely high speed, and there are about 10 layers that are needed in order to finish this, uh, this circuit. Uh, there are resistor layers you have to worry about, at least three of them, insulating layers, interconnect layers, uh, etc. You have to do this, uh, perform the function, and also you have to do it at a very low cost. That's a, uh, an important hurdle. Next. Uh, now, in order for us to uh, make uh, circuits, one has to have a very good quality uh, device. And here is a switching device uh, called Josephson Junction, uh, first uh, made in this country uh, by John Rowell, uh, but it was uh, predicted by uh, Brian Josephson. And here is a situation where uh, you pass a, pass a current through a device, Okay, the current in is vertical in this case, and the voltage is horizontal. You pass a current through a device, and you can uh, maintain zero voltage or zero resistance state. And uh, it is possible to alter the Josephson uh, threshold by external means and switch from this state to that state. And uh, Professor Van Duzer is going to give you uh, a great deal more detail about this in his uh, presentation. Uh, but all I want to uh, give you here is that one must be able to have very high quality uh, devices after we achieve uh, the first hurdle, which is making good films. Next, please. And after you make these high quality devices, you would like to make sure that you interconnect them into uh, useful circuits. And here is an example of uh, the fastest electronic sampling oscilloscope uh, made today. And uh, this was made by, by IBM. And uh, this is an example where you can use three micron size devices and achieve a system rise time of two picosecond. Uh, this is quite an impressive uh, result. And uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the technology will be able to achieve much faster speeds. Just to put it in perspective, two picosecond, uh, the, uh, the nearest a commercially available device or instrument today uh, is 20 picoseconds. So there is a fact, at least a factor of 10 higher performance that is uh, realizable, realizable today. Next slide. Now, this is a, uh, an infrared sensor. The uh, SDI program uh, is paying dividend in this particular slide. Uh, we have taken the challenge of demonstrating that superconductivity is highly sensitive to infrared and far infrared. And uh, the, uh, uh, the Innovative uh, Science and Technology Office of SDI has funded us, and uh, we didn't disappoint them. And we showed them that this technology is superior to conventional technology when it comes to high sensitivity and high speed. Next slide. Uh, superconductors have, uh, have gaps. And uh, we show sensitivity to uh, infrared uh, or visible 
by altering this gap. This is a, a current volt characteristic which shows the uh, superconducting gap right here. And by shining light, infrared or uh, uh, ultraviolet, you alter the gap. Uh, and you can see it here shifted from this value to this value. And we de detect that. And that's a very highly sensitive device that uh, we have uh, demonstrated. Next slide. Now. to be able to uh, manufacture these chips at very low cost. And there is concept of yield that uh, came with the advent of integrated circuit. Um, it is important that the devices have the similar characteristic across an entire three or four or five inch wafer or across the chip. And in order for us to pronounce or announce that we have a manufacturing facility, we must uh, demonstrate the ability to make them uh, in a uniform manner. Here's, here is an example of a statistically significant number of devices uh, demonstrating that you can achieve uh, about a 3% uh, uniformity across one centimeter uh, area. Next slide. The, uh, so you had to jump the, uh, those technological hurdles of making films, then devices, then make uh, integrated circuits, and then worry about how you can manufacture them uh, at a lower cost, and then you have to worry about how are you going to make a system. And it, yeah. uh, the, uh, the system that we chose is, is, uh, is an instrument which uh, has uh, very high speed and very high sensitivity uh, to demonstrate credibility for the technology, and uh, will be uh, a, a technology that will allow us to uh, introduce other more sophisticated system. Next slide. Well, here's the system that has to be uh, made appealing to the customer, uh, has to be reliable, and it has to be transportable. And uh, in order to achieve this goal, we have to uh, come up with innovations in cooling technology so that we are able to uh, take this uh, input module right here and plug it uh, uh, and uh, demounted as uh, in conventional instruments. And that proved to be a challenging task which we finally uh, came up uh, with. Next slide. The, this is the, uh, the product. This is the chip which is in the product. And uh, we had to come up with uh, a scheme which sprays liquid helium on this superconducting uh, corner while at the same time maintain this end at room temperature uh, and just uh, this is the actual chip itself, and this is a dime. So you maintain uh, this corner at 4 degree Kelvin, which is liquid helium, and the opposite edge is maintained at 300 degree Kelvin. There are very interesting uh, engineering challenges to achieve this. Next slide. No, it's out, please. Okay. Next slide, please. This is the uh, cooling. Uh, there are mechanical, electrical, and thermal constraints that have to be met simultaneously and also uh, have to worry about the picky customers that they want something that is demountable as they can do it with uh, conventional technology. So we didn't disappoint them. Next time, next slide. Now, is this instrument useful? And here is an example where we took a very sophisticated, high-performance package to package communication systems or computer systems and we try to look at it with conventional instrument, okay, and then compare the results with this PSP 1000, uh, our instrument. Now, I have to make the analogy with microscope. If you are given uh, a microscope for the first time and uh, you look at things, uh, you would be surprised uh, that the things that you haven't, been, uh, you haven't seen before. Now, oscilloscopes uh, behave like that. Here are examples of, of uh, features that really you could not resolve with conventional uh, instruments. Okay. Whereas if you look at uh, uh, the superconducting electronic system, 
you can see these features and you can localize them in space and uh, you find out whether they're good or bad and you go ahead and advance your uh, sophisticated package. Next. Now the time domain reflectometer is like a radar, uh, but it's used in, in circuits. You send a pulse and you look at your target, the reflected signal tells you uh, the range and uh, what your target is. Now time domain, time domain reflectometers are used uh, to uh, develop sophisticated packages and devices. And here, uh, having a factor of five uh, higher performance means that you can resolve uh, spatial discontinuity, uh, discontinuity to, uh, uh, to a higher degree. An example of uh, deliberately making very tiny notches of uh, a tenth of a millimeter, and they are separated by three millimeters, and uh, this instrument that we introduced uh, resolved uh, these discontinuities very clearly, and if we actually took uh, instruments based on the second electronic revolution, the transistor, uh, that will not do it. Uh, next slide. I'd like to conclude by uh, telling you that superconducting electronics uh, is indeed a reality, and uh, the advent of high TC superconductivity is going to make it even more exciting. Uh, my customers ask me if the liquid helium we, we use here, uh, we use now, can be replaced with uh, liquid nitrogen. Uh, we say yes, and uh, we're very excited uh, about uh, the uh, future uh, potential of high TC material. Thank you. Dr. Ferris, thank you very much, and I think that uh, certainly he has begun to convince us of what his uh, position is with respect to this new technology and where it's going to lead us. Uh, the next speaker uh, is going to speak to us again on this whole area of current superconducting devices, and one of the questions is how do we move technology from the laboratory to the marketplace? Dr. Sibley Burnett farmed advanced cryomagnetics uh, incorporated this year in early 1987 to provide just that mechanism, a technology nursery where ideas are nurtured, fertilized, developed, pruned, and ultimately transplanted into the marketplace. Dr. Burnett is not new to this process. In the fall of 1983, as an employee of GA Technologies, he took superconducting magnet technology that resided in that company and identified the emerging market of superconducting magnets for magnetic resonance imaging some of the examples that we discussed earlier. His success in carrying out the process was outstanding. He and the people of the subsidiary that he formed applied superkinetics, succeeded in designing and manufacturing a product that clearly leapfrogged the magnets available in 1984. In 18 months, the subsidiary was profitable, and in 26 months, the entire R&D investment had been repaid. Woe it were true in all of our companies that that was possible. In 1986, Applied Superkinetics had sales of 6.2 million. Before building Applied Superkinetics, uh, Dr. Sibney Burnett was director of the Fusion Technology and Development Division at GA Technologies and has extensive background in fusion power research. Prior to, prior to joining GA in 1976, Dr. Burnett was branch chief of the Tokamak Systems Branch, the Division of Controlled Thermonuclear Research at the Atomic Energy Commission in Washington, with responsibility for coordinating, budgeting, planning, and monitoring Tokamak fusion research programs at five major laboratories in the United States. His experience in fusion research began at the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory on the CINELAC project. Also, while at Los Alamos, he was a member of the initial design team for a fusion reactor system based on the Theta Pinch and is a co-inventor of the Theta Pinch reactor concept. He received his, uh, Dr. Burnett is a physicist, he received his uh, undergraduate degree from Georgetown College and his master's and PhD degrees from the University of Tennessee. And today we're going to see uh, an interesting discussion of a bureaucrat turned entrepreneur. Dr. Burnett. Dr. Good. 
this morning at breakfast, um, I was having breakfast with the executive vice president from GA Technologies, Mr. Rue Graves, and Rue came to GA from the commercial sector, not uh, from government research laboratory as I did. And he asked me, he said, uh, is this sort of conference uh, common? And I thought for a minute and I said, no, Rue, this sort of conference is impossible. The organizers of this conference are to be commended for in a very short period of time they brought together something the likes of which I haven't seen in 15 years of research and development. Can I have the first slide, please? How do we get technology from the laboratory to the commercial marketplace? I want to tell you a little bit about how we did it at GA Technologies over the last four years. The product was a superconducting magnet used in whole body medical imaging based on nuclear magnetic resonance. If I can have the next slide, please. In the 1970s, the fusion program at GA Technologies under Dr. Tahiro Okawa undertook to build a very large and complex fusion research device, the doublet three. This device required very large magnets, D-shaped magnets, and at that time we made the magnets out of copper, not, supercondu not superconductor. The goal of GA in being involved in the fusion program was to push the frontiers of the technology, but also to be in a place where we could be involved in the commercialization of fusion when it came. We began to bring into our house experts in the various technologies that supported fusion. One of those people was Mr. John Purcell. If I can have the next slide, I'll show the superconducting magnet that he built when he was at the Fermi laboratory. Next slide, please. John was project man manager for the large bubble chamber magnets that were built first at Argonne and then at Fermi Laboratory. When John designed and built this magnet, the largest superconducting systems at that time would sit here on this table virtually, a large step forward. I had the opportunity of beginning to work with John in 1976, and we realized that it would be a little while before we'd be building fusion superconducting magnets, so we began to look for those one-of-a-kind systems where we could apply our art. We built a magnet for the National Bureau of Standards that was used to measure the absolute ampere. Uh, we worked with a company in Pennsylvania by the name of Erie's Magnetics to prototype and then build superconducting magnet used in the magnetic separation of impurities from kaolin, the clay that is used uh, in China and in making slick paper. If I can have the next slide. In about 1981, we started working with Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory to build what may someday be a large commercial um, application of superconductivity, that being energy storage. There is, a mag there is a power line that runs from Bonneville in the Pacific Northwest to Los Angeles called the Pacific Intertie. In the spring of the year, it carries about two power plants of excess power down to the Los Angeles area. We designed and built this magnet to act as an electrical surge tank on that line. The line was always plagued with some transient instabilities. This magnet stores 30 megajoules of energy. It was a 2.8 Tesla magnet, about 10 and a half feet in diameter on the inner bore. And it was used to sit and transfer energy in and out of the line at a 10 megawatt rate and damp out the instabilities in the line. And we had built a lot of one-of-a-kind and few-of-a-kind magnets, and we even at one time looked at the possibility at GA of buying a wire company and going into the commercial business. But none of us could ever be convinced that there was a real business there. And so we continued to be largely an R&D house. In the spring of 1983, Dr. Harold Agnew, who was our president at GA Technologies, began to ask me more and more, when are we going to look at the possibility of using our technology in superconducting magnets for this new emerging market of magnets for magnetic resonance imaging in the medical field. And if I can have the next slide, Dr. Good has showed uh, one uh, version uh, of the uh, system that we're talking about. This is another one, actually I believe this is a Siemens system, the one she showed was manufactured by General Electric. In the summer of 1983, we put together a small task force to see if there was really a marketplace here and if we had technology that would apply. There was no question about the fact 
that there was a market and that we had technology but the question for us was how do we successfully get to the marketplace well they asked me to lead that task force and it was about that time in the summer of one thousand nine hundred three that i broke the first rule at g a now before i got through building applied super kinetics i'm convinced i broke every rule in the little white book that was the policy and procedures manual i was running the fusion development program and had a rather large bid and proposal budget at my disposal and could sign off for fifty thousand dollars without getting a lot of corporate approval i saw that this was going to go and had a very good chance of being successful but the lead time for the superconducting wire we needed in our prototype was about six months and so i simply took my pen in hand and wrote out a purchase request for the superconducting wire called jimmy wong at supercon and said start making the wire we'll find some way to pay for it we were successful and uh... moved on from that point i say at that point in time we had no approval but we were on our way next slide please i presented the findings of our task force to the gulf board of directors at that time they were our owners at ga technologies um, i believe it was, it was the end of september in eighty three and uh, at the end of the presentation, the chairman of the board from Gulf Oil said to Harold Agnew, said, this is a good program. I think we should go forward. But this time, let's get a real manager. Well, my heart sank to the floor. <laughs> Fortunately, Harold came to my defense and convinced the gentleman that I should be allowed to go forward with the project. That night, I was on the airplane to Boston. The next morning, we bought our winding machine. The next slide, please. About that time, we had a phenomenal stroke of luck. If you recall, in early 1984, Gulf Oil was sold to Chevron. About that time, Chevron had so many big problems that GA Technologies was sort of the forgotten stepchild out there in San Diego. From that time on, I never had another major corporate review. Within GA, we set up a steering committee, which monitored our progress. We held to our timetable, and it's described here on this slide. In looking back in hindsight, we had every one of the numbers in our business plan to within 10 percent. Now, for those of you who have ever been involved in a startup type of organization, you know to be that close to your business plan three years down the road is nothing but blind luck. If I can have the next uh, view graph, I'll show you the plant that we moved into in January of 1984. We moved about five miles away from the parent company. Now, we were building a new venture within a very large company, and I felt it was important to get away from all of the scientists and engineers. We wanted to be close enough that when we needed them, they could come down and be there in a very short period of time, but just far enough away that they didn't come and see us at lunchtime and try to change the design. This little, this little plant of about 10,000 square feet is now turning out one magnet a week, a product that sells for about a quarter of a million dollars to the various system houses. Um, we've shipped 53 magnets, and the total people employed in the facility itself are about 20 people. If I can have the next slide, I think this is a picture of the magnet that we built. I want to say a word about our design approach. We met every morning, the project manager, the operations manager, and the head of engineering and with us were whatever engineers we needed to discuss the design issue that was on the table for that day. We met every morning for a period of time. As the team leader, it was my responsibility to try to make everyone share the responsibility for success. Sometimes I referred to that as making everyone share the grief. What you want to make sure is that the, the little quiet cryogenic engineer over on one side of the room is not drowned out by a very loud voice stress analysis on the other side of the room who makes his opinion very strongly while you need to listen to all of the inputs. The um, product that we came up with turned out to be very appropriate for the mobile magnetic resonance market. The next slide, please. A lot of the MR systems that are in use in the United States move from hospital to hospital to spread the capital cost of buying these expensive diagnostic devices. This one is one that I'm particularly proud of. Here it's shown sitting in the parking lot at the hospital in Orlando, where it is home-based. On Wednesday night, this little puppy gets on the road and moves to Atlanta, and image is there for two days, and then on the weekend goes to Birmingham, and on Sunday night comes back over to Orlando. 1,750 miles a week, imaging seven days a week, and it's been doing that for nine months now. 
I want to turn now to talk about some of the keys that I believe are successful in moving technology, which we had in-house, to a successful commercial marketplace. The next slide, please. No one would deny that we have to have the technology in hand. But I think also it's very important that you have people who have had the experience in building products with high technology. You can't make the marketplace happen. You have to respond to it and watch it and grow with it and move with it. But for your, for your commercial venture to be successful, there must be a real market there and you must track it very accurately. Scientists and engineers are always convinced they can continue to make the product better and better. Someone has to stand up and freeze the design and deal with the disappointed engineer who is just ready to tell you about how he could make it so much better if we could just put this into the final design. The timely shutoff of the engineering and going on with establishing the product is very important. Persevering people. I remember the story as I was preparing this talk. We were winding our first prototype magnet. We've been operating two shifts a day. It took us about six weeks to wind it. We now wind that same magnet in about 25 hours. I had worked most of the day and uh, had worked into the night with the technician uh, in the winding room. About 10 o'clock, I decided I'd better go on home. We were hoping to get finished the next day so that we could test the magnet two days hence. And I left Quentin by himself for a few moments. Uh, to, to finish up and sort of close the room out because I was coming back at 4.30 the next morning. When I uh, got in at 4.30 the next morning, Quentin was still there. The machine had gone down soon after I had left, and he knew that to be able to finish the next day, he had to stay on with that, with that machine and get it running again for the next morning. That young man is now our service manager. He travels all over the United States. Uh, helping people understand problems that they have with a, when the, a high technology problem occurs. And then finally, it's very important that all the people working on the project feel they're part of the team and learn how to peel together, to, to pull together. The next slide, please. It's important that technologies and skills get coupled. Very often in a small venture, you don't have 10 people, each one uh, responding to their specialty. Very often, one person will have to cover two or three skills. And it's very important, particularly, that these people talk through this chain. And if you follow the chain, you can see it runs all the way down. I'll just say briefly that I think that last one, which is a sort of an interesting word, a fighter, someone who is leading this team has to be able to stand up to all of the pressure. During the entire second year, when we were trying to get into the marketplace, I only had one question asked to me. Have you made a sale? Not, is the product good? Are we going to make it in the long term? The only question was, have we made a sale? The next slide, please. I call what we did at GA Technologies entrepreneuring because we did it within a large company, and there's some real advantages and disadvantages that come from doing just that. First of all, you don't have to go see your banker or your venture capitalist on Monday morning. Your banker is your company, and that is a real advantage because you understand the system and they understand who you are. Perhaps the most important point of entrepreneuring is the ease with which you can get, use, and return people. You very often need a skill for a brief period of time during an evolutionary program, and the right person can often be found within the parent company and loaned to you for a period of time. And then you don't have to fire that person when you're through with them you can send them back to the parent company. Also, when you go out to market, you carry the name of the large firm behind you. For a long time, I talked of our magnet as being the GA Technologies magnet, not the Applied, super, uh, applied Superkinetics magnet. But there's some disadvantages. Although the financial risk to the entrepreneur is smaller in this program where we do it within a company, the reward is certainly less in terms of financial dollars. And finally, there is no one that will forget that at some point in time, before you did this wonderful feat, you were their office mate. You were literally a prophet within your own land. In closing, if I could have the last slide, I want to quote 
an article from May of this year in the Wall Street Journal. Whenever entrepreneurs close the gap between complex technology and simple manufacturing, they stand to prosper. This was the secret of applied superkinetics, and this will be the secret of small, newly venturing firms as they try to apply the new high temperature superconductors. Thank you. Dr. Burnett, thank you very much. Uh, I think you can tell from these uh, uh, presentations that surely the um, innovation in existing superconducting systems is alive and well, and that there's lots of opportunity for moving from where we are to where one hopes to go. Uh, now, if I could have the lights, we have a little bit of time, and I do have one announcement which I have been asked to make. Uh, if if uh, Paul Samola is in the audience, uh, it's critical that he call his wife immediately. I was told to also tell him that it's not a problem with his wife, but that uh, he should attempt to uh, do that right away. Uh, at this point, uh, we do have a few minutes. Uh, I want to uh, make a couple of announcements, uh, and then if we have a little bit more time, we will have a few questions from our two panelists uh, with where they think some of the work that they've described is going and what perhaps the next kind of commercial uh, development and announcement may be. Uh, this afternoon, uh, beginning immediately after lunch, the East Ballroom, which is to your right, will have a major display area. Uh, there are several uh, programs that are set up over there, which uh, you are invited to review at your leisure and uh, which you're invited to, uh, to uh, look at. Uh, one of these, uh, let me just run through very quickly, you get a feeling for them. Uh, the Department of Defense has a static display which is of unusual quality, a museum quality uh, display which has a great deal of explanation on superconductivity. Uh, the f a couple of fun things, uh, the uh, levitation experiments which have been developed by the National Bureau of Standards and uh, AT&T will be there uh, in a booth uh, for your enjoyment. I recommend particularly that you get a chance to see those. Uh, the new squid device uh, d designed and put together by the National Bureau of Standards uh, is there. There is also a display from Argonne National Laboratories, uh, which I think you will find fun because it's designed to use the new high temperature superconducting materials, and so far as uh, anyone is aware, it is the first commercial uh, sign, not neon sign, you understand, but new superconducting sign. And it's designed so that when you pour the nitrogen in, the sign lights up, so you'll get to play with it a little bit. Uh, there is also a display from the Department of Energy, uh, which is one I think that is of particular interest, and I want to, uh, to stress this one because of those of you in the audience who are interested in, uh, in obtaining information over time. Uh, there is a computer online system uh, from uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, uh, which shows you how to get the up-to-date information up on a screen from the... Um, uh, with respect to getting information uh, as you would like to have it. You can actually retrieve information and, and move with it and get it immediately. And the last one is a superconducting electronic motor, uh, which has come from the testing facility for the Naval Laboratories uh, up in Annapolis. Now, I've been told that we have a little bit more time. I, we, we squeezed the two speakers a little bit this morning, so we'll ask them to uh, add a little bit to what they had to say. And uh, Dr. Ferris, I would like to uh, ask if you would like to spend a couple of minutes uh, with some of the slides that we first took out of your talk, if you like, uh, or at least speaking to those, in terms of where you think the next kind of devices are likely to be. So if you want to, if that microphone is open, you use that one. If not, why well, will okay. first, come here. First, you squeeze me too hard, it hurts. <laughs> uh, the, I wanted to stress that it really requires... Uh, Can everybody in the back here, please? Superconductivity and many other technologies require staying power, tenacity, uh, long-term commitment. Uh, 
it's also very important that we recognize we should combine the tenacity with the risk taking. These two ingredients are very important in ensuring that this country will maintain its uh, technological edge. There are very exciting applications. They could be in communication systems, they could be com in computers. Uh, they would combine uh, the newly discovered high TC material with other technologies. I really have a great deal of confidence that this country, which introduce the vacuum tubes and the transistors and the integrated circuits uh, will prevail. And this conference is very timely and is the step in that direction. There are many things one could do after introducing the first superconducting electronics to the marketplace. The technology is reasonably established. There is more money that needs to be uh, obtained in order for us to go to the next step. Thank you very much, Dr. Ferris. I appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Burnett, would you like to uh, add to your comments, particularly with respect to some of the questions which are being asked uh, with respect particularly to the extension of large magnets, and one of those obviously is the uh, super collider. Yes, let me comment just briefly on what the new superconducting materials will mean to today's commercial applications. Very often I'm asked by customers, should we wait for a magnet that operates at nitrogen temperature? From my experience, I have to answer unequivocally no, for it will be a while. What the new superconducting materials will mean to my way of thinking for today's applications, such as MRI magnets, is not that the cost will change drastically. You still have to build a vacuum vessel. You still have to react to magnetic loads. The difference is in dealing with liquid helium as a coolant as opposed to liquid nitrogen. When you put a commercial product today out in the field, such as a superconducting magnet for MRI, the person that's going to be loading cryogens is probably someone with only a high school education. Most of the problems we've had in the field have been with the lack of education of the people actually handling the product. Liquid nitrogen as a coolant will radically change that situation. Yeah. Dr. Ferris, would you like to comment briefly with respect to, uh, I noticed in some of your literature that you have the ability to shift from the liquid helium uh, units that you have here to with even existing uh, technology to the liquid hydrogen uh, refrigerators which uh, uh, change the technology or at least some of the difficulties. Would you like to speak to that? Because that I think is yeah. essentially an in-house technology today perhaps. I may have misspoken, but let me clarify. Um, the cooling system that we developed uh, which required liquid helium has been uh, also used with uh, liquid nitrogen. So once the uh, high TC material is perfected uh, and uh, we are able to make complicated chips. Uh, it is possible to uh, utilize the same spraying technique uh, that we developed with the high TC uh, chips. And uh, that will, of course, uh, minimize the cost of uh, our system. It will make it uh, relatively more compact and uh, most importantly you improve the performance and uh, uh, give a great deal of uh, value to the customers who are paying our bills. Thank you very much. I think one of the uh, issues with respect to the hydrogen system is that there is, as I understand it, uh, some new technology which is being developed for designing very compact and very efficient hydrogen refrigerators today? The, they are, those are very exciting closed cycle refrigerators and uh, we have uh, uh, a plan to uh, develop systems 
which utilize closed cycle refrigerators, which uh, I'm not going to announce today when we are, will introduce them to market. But we do have these working models uh, in the lab, and uh, that's the next step. You will be able to uh, make superconducting electronic systems very ubiquitous. Uh, you can plug them in every wall and have them in every kitchen, I hope. <laughs> I'm not sure, even though I made the comment earlier about uh, the fact that we have arrived by the uh, uh, reference to the uh, Wall Street Journal and our comic strips, I'm not sure about whether or not the uh, households of today are really quite ready for that, okay? But, uh, well, the incentive is great, <laughs> and uh, they, they will be in for a surprise. Uh, Dr. Burnett, would you like to uh, spend a few minutes? Uh, the whole issue of uh, medical imaging, uh, costs associated with it, have certainly had a great deal of uh, press in recent days, and surely uh, the, the cost of medical care and so on. Uh, if I understood some of the um, uh, material which you had in, attached to your uh, new, the new magnets that you all have designed, would you like to say something about uh, cost reduction potentials in these systems in addition to the one that you discussed, which is simply being able to make it mobile and move it about and use it more effectively, but what about the potential for equipment which has uh, significantly lower costs? Diagnostic imaging equipment is somewhat unique with respect to the government's regulations concerning reimbursement. A good diagnostic study, whether it be through x-ray, CAT scan, chemical workup or MRI has a great deal of capability to actually re reduce overall medical cost simply by the doctor having a better idea of what he's facing when he starts treatment. We basically are an OEM supplier of a magnet to a system house that puts the whole system together and sells it to a hospital. So from a cost reduction standpoint, my focus has been largely with respect to, to the magnets themselves. And we found two ways uh, in the short life of our company to be able to do that. The first one uh, was by reducing the overall magnet size, by squeezing all of the internals that go inside the bore of the magnet uh, to, their, to their minimum degree and being able to reduce the bore of the magnet. But more importantly, we found that as we build the same product over and over again and move it with regularity down an assembly line that is focused on manufacture and not on technology. That the cost reductions that come from the economy of scales and from the greater quality of the product that is turned out, uh, even in a short time from the initial manufacturing of our product, have really been amazing. And I think there is where the frontier is. Most of us in this room who have been involved with superconductivity have been involved in building one-of-a-kind systems, and they are very expensive. It is amazing what you can do when you transfer the knowledge of that one-of-a-kind system into simple manufacturing steps that are carried out by high school graduates as they build highly complex products. Thank you. I, uh, this, this whole question of manufacturing technology uh, obviously is one of the issues today with respect to competitiveness in the United States. And we have been very good at building one-of-a-kind, the front end of the line, uh, and, and being able to, per, to penetrate the very high end of the product lines with these very expensive, if you like, uh, labor-intensive kinds of issues. We've not been so, uh, not done quite so well in many of the cases where it's necessary to really learn that technology that you've just described about manufacturing capabilities. Uh, would either of you like to comment on where, for example, uh, Dr. Ferris, in your Looking at the kinds of systems that you build, this is very complex technology, and the question is, how do you manage it to build a system to do the manufacturing background to get these prices such that it's going to be, to really penetrate the market? First of all, you have to have commitment to a goal, a worthwhile goal. And uh, <laughs> the second is to uh, get good people behind you. In this case, we have uh, very reputable venture capitalists and uh, very brilliant engineers that we put together. And uh, uh, four years ago, we uh, were alone when a major company announced that it was terminating its uh, Josephson Junction project. It was tough um, because 
we try to hire these talented engineers, they tell us, well, you know, we, ha we read headlines that this technology was a loser. Uh, so it was very tough, uh, and you have to be tenacious, have uh, high goals, and uh, call it stubbornness, commitment, or uh, conviction. And that's what does it. Now, we need to use uh, uh, this, uh, really, this is the American way, uh, risk-taking, uh, and this is the only way we can maintain our competitive edge. We have to recognize this resource. Um, I'm really worried uh, about the following. Uh, four years ago, when uh, this technology was called the loser by others, the Japan maintained its facilities and continued for four years to make uh, complex chips for memory and logic, and they have uh, plans to make a computer. And in this country, other than Hypris, nobody has plans to make complex chips from niobium and niobium nitride technology. And I'm worried because in, in Japan, they are in a race with us to excel uh, at the high TC uh, superconductivity, while at the same time, they have niobium and niobium nitride complex chips. They use them as vehicles to build very sophisticated systems. Now, is it Hypris versus Japan Inc.? Uh, I really don't like that. I would like all of you to uh, make sure that niobium and niobium nitride uh, should not be ignored and has to be uh, developed in conjunction with the high TC material. And uh, with that, uh, we, we may uh, avoid a major problem. Okay, thank you. I think this, that this is a, a real question. If you noticed on one of my slides, there is um, significant activity going on in the United States uh, at various companies. The question is how close to commercialization, uh, and we're going to hear about that uh, as the conference goes on. Uh, one of the questions that, uh, uh, Dr. Burnett, I'd like for you to, if you could spend a couple of minutes dwelling on, uh, you've moved into this new company, uh, which is an entrepreneurial kind of a mode. Uh, what is your feeling about this kind of new technology, which we've been told the whole world is changing in the sense that it's going to move much more rapidly from, from laboratory to commercialization, and that the, the uh, time frame between these is collapsing all around us, in fact. Uh, the question is, how do you deal with that these days if you're trying to get into this entire area of getting new companies, getting new starts? Uh, how do you play that game? Well, someone once said that we always overestimate what we can do in one or two years and underestimate what we can do in five to ten years. I'm afraid with the new superconductors, we may have that one backwards right now. Um, however, there is some, some experience to be gained from what we've done with four degree superconductors. My company is one of several here in the United States. Um, I hate to start listing companies, for, for you always leave one out, that have successfully moved technology to the marketplace, but it did take a long time. It really took almost 20 years from the time that we had superconducting wire that worked until there was a real commercial application. Part of that was because there was not a marketplace until the medical industry opened up a significant marketplace for superconducting magnets. The key is to get the scientist, engineer, and the manufacturing person to really communicating. If you're really lucky, you find them all in the same person. And that's the real key because those complex steps that we use to build a one-of-a-kind magnet somehow have to be reduced to very, very simple terms. And that will be the key to moving the new technology to the marketplace. I, I appreciate that. The uh, question, I think, is just as, uh, as, uh, as appropriate, uh, Dr. Ferris. The uh, comments that you made, uh, for example, about the fact many of our audience today come from, larger, from the larger companies in the United States. And the question is, how do they overcome 
these kinds of things and, uh, and how can we play and make these things happen in a shorter time frame? Um, they, they really ought to have managers who are risk takers. <laughs> they uh, ought to be uh, promoted uh, for the risks they take and ought to be compensated for the risks they take and ob obviously their achievements. I think uh, risk taking ought to be encouraged in, uh, in big companies. Uh, that's, uh, uh, I claim that uh, the per capita uh, innovations is extremely high in small companies. And uh, uh, big companies ought to ask themselves why. Could they import talent from outside? That's another uh, suggestion I make uh, <laughs> in order to improve the situation. Thank you very much. Would you like to comment on that as well? You managed it at least under certain circumstances which you described. Well, I'd just make one comment. It's very important to look at novel ways in which to use the facilities we already have. I'll just make a quick comment if I may. In America, we build superconducting wire today, four degree superconducting wire, in three or four s fairly small companies. Each step in that process is one where there has to be a decision as to move it out or to move it back into the, to the company to have the, the, the work done, whether that being firm barring the wire or extruding the billet of copper and superconductor. In Japan, they have found ways to move a very high technology product, such as superconducting wire, through a conventional copper refrigeration plant. All of the steps are carried out right in that big plant. And the, uh, the economy that can come from having the facilities to carry out each step of the manufacturing process already in-house is significant. And they're very competitive in the cost of wire with us, even though today we have a significant advantage here with respect to the dollar to the yen. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Burnett, particularly with respect to uh, the question about uh, innovation within large companies, in a sense what you did was to set up a small venture, as you pointed out, uh, separate from the rest of the company, and you made that work. Uh, and you also, I think, intimated, if you did not come out and directly say so, that the reason that it worked is that you didn't really get a lot of looking at by the company uh, at the time that that innovation was going on. Now the question I have for you is that if things had been different, what is your prediction of success if you had had the same reviews and so forth during that innovation period that is normal for most of us? Well, you can't micromanage uh, a new venture. You've got to sort of give it its head and, and look to see where it is at periods with respect to the technology and to the finances. But if you try to apply the standard kind of management techniques at every step in the evolutionary process of a new venture, it is my opinion that you have a good chance of killing it before it ever gets to the marketplace. Right. Thank you. I, at this point, we have just a couple of minutes left. Uh, I'd like for uh, each of you, if you would, in terms of the kinds of things that are going to be discussed later in the program, uh, which will have to do not so much with what is presently being done, but where we're going and what the high temperature superconductors are going to mean, uh, if you had to guess, and both of you are in a position where you have, you have equipment out there today utilizing the low temperature technology, if you had to guess, where would you put, if you had uh, a, a 90 degree material, Dr. Ferris, today, what would be your first thing to do with it? First, I will not announce it to my competitors. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> uh, I have to be able to see a very uh, high quality uh, switching device before uh, I start to uh, deploy resources to design sophisticated electronics systems. I therefore uh, would like to uh, encourage people to uh, be mindful of the practical constraints that ultimately uh, lead to a successful system and uh, devices, circuits, uh, and uh, preferably they use 
uh, niobium and niobium nitride technologies to practice on okay, in parallel with developing uh, high TC superconducting devices and chips. I cannot give you uh, a year uh, when uh, a very sophisticated electronic system will be introduced to market. That's uh, really too uh, premature. Uh, I remain to be extremely excited about the technology and uh, uh, being a problem solver, uh, I have uh, no doubt that it is going to transform our lives uh, imminently. I think I share that opinion. Uh, if I had an uh, 80 degree superconductor today that had the same current density characteristics, could be stabilized in the way in which we stabilize four degree superconductors today, uh, I think the first application would probably be, be medical imaging magnets because of the current density that's required for the midfield magnets. Uh, I do think it'll change our lives. Uh, I've never seen anything that had the attention of the popular press as does the new <laughs> superconducting materials. Sometimes that bothers me just a little bit. But it will change our lives. The question is when. And I don't believe that it'll be two years from now and it might be five years from now, but it's probably more like 10 years from now when we really begin to see the widespread applications of this new technology really take hold in the marketplace. Right. Uh, you're going to hear later in the program uh, with respect to uh, some of the new uh, possibilities, and particularly uh, the two technologies that you've heard today were based primarily on the fact that these are in the marketplace now, uh, both in the magnet area and in the electronics area, you're going to hear a great deal about other kinds of uh, commercial applications which will be opened up if one can move into the high temperature regime. Uh, there's going to be some, some excellent discussion with respect to uh, what can, one can expect in transportation, uh, what one can expect in other areas, if you like, of the electronics industry in addition to the ones we've talked about here. Uh, I had the uh, opportunity very recently to be in Japan at an advanced materials meeting, and one of the issues I think which is very important about this uh, particular revolution that we're talking about with high temperature superconductors is that the comment was made uh, by the president of NECI at that uh, international meeting, and his comment was that in the next generation of technologies, and particularly high, temper uh, high, high uh, technology types of products, that the people who actually own and control the materials technology will in many ways control the commercialization and the utility of these kinds of devices, which is a rather interesting concept because in some ways it's quite different from what we have seen in the past because in the past with respect to electronics, the, uh, the rewards have gone to those people who could do circuit design, understood the electronics, uh, this time around, the, uh, the innovation is going to be really in this whole concept of materials and being able to design a material which will actually have the properties that one wishes. It's my opinion that this is an area in which this laboratory to commercialization may very well be possible to be much more rapid than the very difficult engineering kinds of things that have gone into some of the innovations in the past. Uh, being a chemist, that pleases me a great deal because it's my position that chemists are going to control the design of those materials. The physicists don't necessarily agree with that, but uh, we have to get a lick or two in whenever we can. But uh, since the physicists have sort of controlled this area of uh, high temperature superconductors, but seriously, the ability to design materials at the molecular level, it seems to me, is really going to be the name of the game. And I'd like to simply back up Eric of some of the Eric Block, some of the comments that he made this morning, uh, that we have really all the way to go. Uh, at this time, I think that uh, the president's party is arriving. Uh, I hope you've very much enjoyed the uh, morning's program. And ladies and gentlemen, we will uh, vacate the podium, and the president's party is here. <laughs>